Hi. Um, yeah, excellent. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about vertical trees. I've been making a few presentations about those already, but they tended to be a bit too uh, deep, technically speaking. Um, so, because this is DEF CON and we're trying to onboard more people, um, this one is going to be a bit more high level, so hopefully uh, enough to, to raise your interest in, uh, in vertical trees. Um, so, yeah, why do we, why do we, uh, why are we considering vertical trees? Uh, it's basically a big change in the, in the way Ethereum functions. So, why do we want to risk this? Well, there are several reasons. The, the first one is we want to be able to build uh, blocks as uh, self-contained execution units. At the moment, Ethereum has a bit of a problem uh, that when you want to join the network or if you haven't followed the network for a while, you need to go through a process that's called a sync. Uh, synchronization, uh, you cannot access the state directly. Uh, it's uh, like you, you cannot just download the state. I mean, you can download the state, but it, um, it, it's a fairly convoluted process. So uh, the idea is that if you include in the block everything that you need, you can just uh, download the block and execute it uh, and see if you're interested. Like even before you, uh, if, even if before you execute the block, you can even know if it's going to be of interest to you or not. And if it's of interest to you, you can uh, execute it. Otherwise, uh, you don't even have to, to care. Uh, so it's something that is, it's to build something that is in between a full client and uh, like a full node and a light client in the sense that you are still supposed to follow blocks, but you don't have to uh, hold uh, the entire state. And it's it's nice because uh, it paves the way for uh, other upgrades or it makes other upgrades a bit simpler. Uh, for example, if you want to uh, shuffle committees between, between shards in the future, um, you, want shards, you don't want shards to fall, uh, shard the validators to keep following the, the chain at all times, like several chains at all times. So it's uh, something that's going to help them uh, get up to speed a bit faster. And of course, uh, there's the, the idea of state expiry, like the state of Ethereum is quite large. Uh, so we want to be able to delete some of the state, but we don't want to delete and uh, forget forever. If your state has been deleted, but you want to use it again, you need, a, you, you need to provide a proof to resurrect your state. And the idea is that uh, vertical trees make your proofs smaller, so it will be cheaper for you to resurrect the state. So uh, because it's a fairly uh, like deeply technical uh, topic, I have tried to, re to make a simpler explanation uh, with pirates. Uh, so imagine you have four pirates, and they, they bury a treasure somewhere, and they plot the directions to get to the treasure on the map, and then they want to go their separate ways. So if they adopt the method, like the metaphorical method that we, uh, we, we currently use in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Ethereum, to store the Ethereum state, what they would do is they would split the, the map in uh, four bits, and then uh, each of the pirates would get uh, their own bit. And when uh, they want to, yeah, when they want to access the, the treasure, they need to, to put all the, the pieces of the map together. The problem is inheritance. If one of the pirates wants to retire and, for example, wants to, uh, to sell you his bit of the, of, of the map, uh, how do you know he's not selling you a fake map, a fake piece of the map? Uh, he's a pirate, after all, so you should be careful. Well. The problem with this, the method that, ha that was chosen, to figure that out, you need at least the other two pirates to check that the, the pattern matches. The proof size is quite involved. It requires you to take uh, the siblings, the, the, simbl the sibling pieces. Now, um, if we use the, the, proof, the proving technique that is, uh, uh, that is suggested by vertical trees, uh, which is called, uh, like, it's based on something called vector commitments, hence the name vertical. Uh, what you do is you, uh, like, cut out something at the center, uh, some uh, little stub, and you make this little stub as hard to reproduce as uh, possible, ideally cryptographically uh, impossible to, to fake, and then everybody goes their separate ways. And when you want to buy the, when you want to buy the, your, your part of the map, uh, all you have to do is make sure that uh, your 
piece fits into that uh, that proof, uh, that, that little stub. Uh, so of course we don't use uh, pieces of paper. We we use cryptography, uh, stronger cryptography than this. And now this is your proof size. And so how do you transpose this to uh, vertical trees? Um, well, the current uh, Ethereum state is stored in a tree where all the data of Ethereum is at the bottom of the tree. And then uh, you group them, uh, the parent is a commitment, the parent node is a commitment, and then the parent of that parent is also a commitment all the way to the top. And uh, the root of the tree is uh, endi ending up in the block. So if you want to prove in the tree, for example, the, the purple square here, if you use the current method, it's the same thing as with the pirates. For each level, you have to pass the siblings. And here, this is a very simple representation. But in, uh, in Ethereum, each parent node has 16 children. And the consequence of this is that you need to pass 16, uh, sorry, 15 other value for each value uh, at each level for each value you want to prove. So there are thousands of values uh, per, that get touched per block. That's, that's a thousand times 15 values per level. And uh, if I remember correctly, the, the, the depth, the, tip, the average depth of the MPT is between 10 and 15. I don't remember exactly. So that's a lot of data. That's roughly, uh, if you want to pass the, that data in a block, that's three megabytes. We are in Bitcoin territory. Um, so yeah, it's a bit too big to pass uh, around the network in a reasonable time. If you use the vertical commitment, so you have the equivalent, like you still have the, whoops, that doesn't, see, yes. Uh, you have the, uh, the little uh, cryptographic proof, but all you, all you have to pass as, uh, as your proof is the, um, the nodes along the way to your value. And that is much smaller, first of all, because you don't pass the siblings. But on top of that, because you don't pass the siblings, there's a virtual cycle that allows you to widen the tree. You can have more children per tree and uh, per, uh, per node. And as a result, the tree gets shallower. So your path is even smaller, uh, even shorter. And as a result, your proof is, uh, is that much smaller. So uh, there's a, unfortunately, it's not that simple. There's a, quite a few changes to, to introduce at the same time. Uh, like the first one is uh, putting the proofs in the block. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the whole point. Uh, but we also need to change the tree structure. And I'm not gonna get too deep into the details because uh, once again, it's quite involved. There's an EIP, there are other talks about it. Uh, look at them, look them up if you're interested. But the idea is that all the data ends up in a single tree. So currently, uh, accounts have their own tree and for each account, you have um, the, another tree that encodes the storage for this account. Well, here, everything is kind of uh, yeah, hashed or mixed together and spread over the tree. Um, each item, like each account item, for example, the balance, the nonce, uh, the code, the, uh, any, any slot, like for example, uh, if you're thinking of crypt CryptoKitty, uh, each cat is uh, accessed independently because we don't want to add more to the proof that is uh, required. So if I'm sending funds to, to a, a new address, well, uh, I just need the address, the target address balance. I don't need to know how many, uh, how much code they have. I'm only interested in, uh, in the funds. Um, right, and like I was saying, the data is spread all over the tree, um, but we are trying to group uh, things that belong together uh, a little bit so that you don't spend your time jumping all over the tree all the time. So it's grouped uh, in batches of 256. And uh, I'm going to go over that uh, in just, uh, just a bit. So this is a picture that comes from the EIP itself I'm going to describe. On the left side, you've got what's called the stem tree. And it's the, basically the top of the tree. So the tree is flipped uh, to the side. It's rotated 90 degrees to the to the left, and um, the root, uh, sorry, the, the stem tree uh, only has a branch node, so that means every node in that tree has at least two children. When, the, um, when you take your key and you follow, the, um, you follow the, the path traced by the key, at some point you will reach a moment where there's only one group, that is a group of 256, that is uh, uh, pointed out by this key. So there's this intermediate uh, like 
what's called an extension. Yeah, I don't quite see the pointer here. But, uh, sorry, but the blue the blue box um, that extension says this is uh, the prefix, the 31 byte prefix that every key below me um, have uh, like uh, are, are keyed by. So um, that means that uh, if when when you go through the tree and you com you have to compare the key that you're using with the the encoding the, the key encoded in that blue box uh, and if it's the same that means your data is uh, in the group below it otherwise your uh, your data is not present in the tree and then there's the suffix tree so that corresponds to the 256 values and there's a, th a fourth column that we're not going to cover. It's not really important for, for this talk. Um, so, like I said, every, every piece of data is broken into chunk. That means, for example, the code is uh, broken into bits, uh, into 31 byte pieces that are fitted in a 32 byte uh, piece. The storage slots are also have their own, uh, on, have their own data. The, the balance has its own uh, value. And um, each of these uh, values, uh, each of these chunks is uh, given an offset. And for example, the, the, the balance is always at offset one, uh, the nonce at offset two. And then um, a bit further, you have the beginning of where the code is supposed to start. And then even further, you have the, the bit where the, uh, all the data slots are, are supposed to, to be. And the way uh, you find them in the tree is you take the address of, uh, so you, you have a key that is made of two, two parts. The, the, the 31st bytes are called the stem, and the suffix is just a byte that indexes in the group that we saw before. Um, I'm talking about the, the third column here. So the, the last byte is the index in there. And, um, and so the, to build the stem, what you do is you take the address of the account, and you take the, th the first 31 bytes of uh, the, the offset of that chunk, and you, you hash them using uh, what's called a Pedersen hash. So it's like, uh, it's like Ketchak, but it's uh, much more friendly uh, for, uh, for ZK applications. And it's also uh, much slower. But uh, you, you get, uh, you, so you get a 32 byte values. You take the, the 31st bytes of this value, and uh, that gives you the stem. And the way you use it when you compare it to the tree, uh, the stem will give you the pass through uh, the stem tree and the extension. And when you, you found that, you use the suffix to select the, the value in the group. Um, so like I said, uh, just a recap, uh, vertical trees are, are nice because you can make the tree much larger, much uh, smaller, uh, much more shallow, sorry. Um, you can also uh, experiment with, uh, with ideas like uh, you could think, so I know that this is very inter interesting to DAP developers, you can just download the blockchain, not care about the state, and when you look at the when you look at the proof in the block at the witness, you can uh, you can figure out if your um, if that uh, block is accessing something you're interested in, excuse me interested in. So, for example, um, if uh, yeah if your crypto kitty. Uh, you want to see if the CryptoKitty contract is accessed. If so, you just uh, execute that block to update your internal state. If not, you don't care. Um, yeah, and I was, uh, uh, that was just a recap for the rest of the slide. So what is the current state of uh, vertical tree implementations? Uh, we have one and a half running test nets. Um, the, we have one testnet that is uh, fully working. It's a proof of work testnet called Condrieux. I'll give the address at the end. Um, and so, uh, proof in blocks, uh, it works, it works, it's been working for a while. And then, uh, there's a proof of stake testnet that is uh, currently in bring up phase. So, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get it to, to work for, for DEF CON, but it, it's going to happen shortly. When we do performance, we uh, currently have, like, performance testing, we see that it's currently five times slower than a regular mainnet. So, when we replay blocks, from mainnet, mainnet on a translated vertical tree layer, it's uh, five times uh, slower. Um, we have been, uh, we took it down, for, it used to be 40x, so it's, uh, it's a bit faster already. We have another avenue uh, to, to f uh, make it faster, but 
it's, I, I mean, in my opinion, it's always going to be a bit slower than uh, the current uh, method, but it offers some opportunities uh, to, to build uh, interesting applications, so I think it's worth it. Um, and there are, uh, there are like three implementations, uh, and there's a fourth one uh, ongoing with, uh, with Besu. So I wanted, so I don't know if it's quite readable, but I wanted to give an example of uh, what you can do with virtual trees. So there's a block explorer on, on that testnet, on the running testnet, and there's a piece of software uh, that is able to read the block and reconstruct a view of the network, sorry, of the tree, that is uh, everything you know to re-execute the block on top of it. Um, so I don't know if it's quite visible, I still don't see the pointer, but basically you can see that the, the leftmost branch here is an account, the, the next bran the branch, uh, the right of it is another account, uh, I mean I can tell because, uh, uh, because of the way the, the last level uh, looks like, and uh, you have the, the other two uh, branches from the root, these do not have a very deep tree, and that's because uh, this is a proof of absence, so that means uh, this is the way you signal that those uh, branches those locations did not exist before the execution of the block. And what definitely happened here um, is that those two uh, accounts on the left probably sent funds to those two accounts on the right that did not exist yet, and that they will exist after the, the execution of the block. Uh, so it, it's quite interesting because you, you can see what's going on, you can visualize it this way without loading the whole tree. Uh, right, so this is the current state. What are uh, the challenges we still have to overcome? Uh, one of them is the transition. Uh, converting a, Mer a Merkle tree to a vertical tree is no, is no walk in the park. Uh, it requires a lot of RAM, it requires a lot of disk space, um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite difficult. So um, there are two methods, really two avenues to do this, uh, this translation. Either you entrust the conversion to very powerful machines. Uh, I have a test a machine that, that is a Xeon. It takes it uh, six days. I know Aragon is able to do it in like uh, less than a day, but even, even for Aragon, it's, uh, it's not instant. Um, and uh, the, where was I? Yes, um, so that's the first avenue. The second avenue we have to do the translation is simply to pace it uh, to the slowest machine on the network. So uh, that would be to do uh, a translation of, let's say, 5, 10, 100 values per block, but this would last for a month, but then every node on the network would theoretically be able to follow. Um, so these methods are, have names. Uh, the one where, uh, like, you follow the pace of the network, it's called the overlay tree. Um, the other one was called offline conversion. There's a third one, that is uh, known as the roll-up appreciation week, where you just do nothing for a week or a month, and you wait for everybody to be done uh, translating. That's, uh, it's just here because it's a cool name, no one's really considering that. Um, yeah, one last thing I wanted to say about this slide is uh, pre-images. So uh, most, of cl most clients, including Geth, do not uh, encode the addresses directly. They just write the, the hash of those, uh, those addresses. So to do the translation, and because we use a different hash system, we need the pre-images. It turns out that most clients do not store that. Um, well, Aragon does, but the rest of them don't. So uh, pre-image availability is another problem that needs to be, uh, needs to be addressed, and uh, it's, not a, it's not an easy one. Uh, another thing is uh, the slower um, crypt uh, cryptographic primitives. It's not as fast as Ketchak. So this is one of the latest uh, runs, and uh, you can see that roughly 30%, 33%, 35% is spent just doing uh, elliptic curve operations. So um, cryptographic uh, primitives is really where uh, the, um, well, the effort needs to be, uh, the optimization effort needs to be made. So either by writing faster crypto or uh, by, uh, by not calling those functions as much. So uh, caching, for example, is, is a technique that has worked well. Uh, yeah, there's a slide on database design. So basically the idea is that, uh, that like current, most clients have written their, uh, optimized their database layout and their database uh, access layer for the current MPT, 
a lot of those assumptions are no longer valid, uh, let alone help, helpful with vertical trees. So there will be some uh, need to adapt to something that is a bit close to, to what Aragon is doing, uh, but that will take time, unfortunately. And uh, I wanted to finish on people, uh, on what you can do if you want to help. Uh, the first thing would be, there, there are test nets. So the first thing you can do is just try to deploy your contracts on, on, test, on the test net and see if that works. Um, if uh, you can also try to run your own client, um, like uh, hashtag testing the verge, um, you can also modify uh, a CL client to figure out how to uh, propagate the proofs because currently uh, it's not, it's, it hasn't been defined, so it would be interesting to, to run a fact-finding mission, uh, f yeah, finding out where and how the proofs need to be, need to be propagated in a, in a proof-of-stake world. Like I said, crypto is the, uh, is the bottleneck, so if you can uh, find a better crypto, cryptographic primitive than what we have, that would be also quite helpful. Um, uh, yeah, it's also going to affect uh, layer two solutions. Like, presumably, layer two uh, uh, layer two um, groups don't really want to to uh, diverge too much from uh, from the main net. So um, they they will need to they will need to um, to adapt as well. There's no really uh, there's not a clear path for that yet. Um, like I said, pre-images are also a problem. So if you have a way to to make pre-images available to everyone, that's a very good uh, that's a very good test, very useful. And then you can go crazy. You can uh, try to prototype uh, the interaction of vertical tree with the portal network. With uh, try to implement state expiry using vertical trees. All of that. None of uh, none of all of that is greenfield, but it's uh, also quite interesting to to get some uh, some information, some ideas of uh, of what is to come. And uh, with this, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I have put the addresses of the two test nets, knowing that the second one is uh, still in a bring up phase, so it will probably not work today. But the other one uh, is the landing page for the proof of work test net, and this one works, or should work. Um, and uh, you, can look, you can look at the explorer, you can send, uh, you can send transaction, you can, you can try everything. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Guillaume. Guillaume, do you mind taking a minute uh, to answer our questions? Sure, uh, sure. If you do have any questions for Guillaume, go ahead and raise your hand, and one of the volunteers will actually come towards you. Uh, there's a question right there uh, in the fourth row, or five, fifth row with a black sweatshirt. You mentioned accessing data is going to be a little bit different. Does this imply that like um, tooling teams and wallets and such are going to have to like enforce access lists now moving forward? No, uh, it doesn't mean that, but it means that the gas model is going to change to, uh, to follow this, this new model, uh, which is why I was like, if you've got a contract, please deploy it on the testnet. Uh, but you do not need, uh, access lists are going to disappear. They're replaced by uh, something else that is not really ex exposed to the, to the, to the user. So to, for the end user, in theory, apart from the gas cost, everything will be transparent. Oh, there's one more question. Do you mind answering one more? Can I repeat the question real quick? Oh, sure. I'm just going to paraphrase it real quick. And they said that they wanted to know if there's any drawbacks to the vertical trees. Yes, there's plenty of drawbacks. Like I said, there's the, the transition, the, the slow crypto. Um, otherwise, uh, yes, like the biggest drawback I only alluded to uh, in the previous answer, it's that the gas model changes. And that means that a lot of code, uh, you know, like uh, contracts tend to, some contracts tend to be very, optimized for gas, uh, those optimization can turn out to be completely obsolete and counterproductive. Uh, so that, I would say that's, uh, that's the biggest uh, drawback I can think of. Awesome. If you have any other questions for Guillaume, I'm sure you'll be over to the side. Yep, Feel free to absolutely. ask him uh, after the talk, too. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.